do it. There we go. Okay, so I would like to introduce um, Fritz Elder. I'm, I'm sorry, Fritz Edler, um, <laughs> and I do know that, <laughs> he's coming out wrong. Um, Fritz is based in Washington. He's joining us from Washington, DC. He's a veteran railroader who began working as a rail freight car builder repairer in 1978. And he's worked in many capacities from maintaining track and bridges to running high speed trains. Fritz has been a rail workers union officer for decades and is now a special representative for Railroad Workers United, a North American cross craft solidarity and advocacy organization. Fritz has broad rail industry knowledge regarding infrastructure, energy, environmental impact, and economics for heavy and light rail, both passenger and freight, in uh, national and international contexts. Beginning in 2015, Fritz headed the international defense effort for the rail workers who were scapegoated after the terrible 2013 Lac Megantique volatile oil train wreck. It was a victory for rail crews, trackside communities, and environment when scapegoating by the Canadian government failed. Working at the intersection of safety needs and of rail crews and sustainable communities, Fritz believes that railroads can and must be a crucial part of the green transportation future. And Fritz, thank you again for joining us and sorry for that rocky introduction. Oh, well, it's, it's fine. And, and thank you so much for your, your whole group, but uh, for Jerry, you in particular, because uh, I have uh, so much appreciated your advocacy in your community and also your, uh, uh, you know, close and, and important work that you've done uh, to bring in others and to have forums and to make a good public presentation about some of these questions. Basically, you're filling a void that no one else is addressing. And uh, uh, as you've, you've said, you're starting to get more eyeballs and more people are, are learning about these things. So I uh, congratulate that work and appreciate your asking me to come and have a conversation with you. And I, I will, you know, go through some of these things, but perhaps some people will have questions as well. Uh, so shall I start talking a little bit about the lack of Megantic, uh, experience and then we'll go on from there. Or? That would be great. We actually yeah. um, taped their memorial on uh, July 6th mm -hmm. and they, um, Gilbert and um, Robert Bellafleur, Gilbert Carret, right. Carre, Carret yep. and uh, Robert Bellafleur, they have both been speakers with, with our group. So they, they we're, we're familiar with them, but we would love to hear um, your perspective because you were involved in the trial and they really haven't uh, had a flavor of that yet. Well, uh, they're both friends of mine, I, I, I'm pleased to say, uh, and I'm honored to, in, to say that, that I got to know them both. Um, I made about six visits to the community there over the course of a couple of years, uh, just in background. And so most of you all are already familiar with the, um, the, the basic facts of the wreck itself in 2013. Um, uh, and for me, I, I was like a lot of railroaders in that. I mean, I hate to say this, but we have problems in our industry we have wrecks and we have disasters and we have things and the, um number one we do tend to get sometimes a little jaded about it uh in terms of its impacts and things but but in addition to which we also um run up against the problem where we find that that there doesn't seem to be a good way to get the truth out there doesn't seem to be a good way to really talk about the, the real reasons why these problems happened and stuff. And so, you know, early on, we followed like all the rest of the people across the continent, watching on television, seeing the pictures of the, 
explosions and the and the disaster and learning about them and through the grapevine we would get little bits of information and we also were inundated like everyone else was with the initial propaganda about how well this was really just the fault of the railroad workers and it really affected a lot of the people on in the industry at my level at the worker level because we've kind of gotten i mean first of all the huge majority of the people who do the work of running the trains have a very high standard for themselves. And when they hear about something that this, where the suggestion is there that somebody didn't do what they were supposed to do, they take it very seriously. And it's, it's, uh, you know, that's an important thing. And, and I can tell you that within even RWU, we we actually had some debates as we got little bits of information, things became known about, you know, what was the real deal there. But the the I don't know, the I guess the floodgates really started to open in terms of our understanding of things when we had a um, all day conference in Chicago. Uh, it was a rail safety conference that we conceptually decided there would be part, you know, about half railroaders and about half people who were, you know, let's say bomb train uh, activists and environmentalists. And at that conference, uh, the attorney for Tom Harding, who was the engineer on the train in the wreck, came and spoke. And I had been reading articles. And I, I'd already started to get a certain perspective on this, but after listening to it and, and some conversations, I I went to our um, uh, secretary treasurer and I said, you know, we have to get into this. We, meaning Railroad Workers United, we got to, you know, we have to be part of this defense. And the central reason for that was because the one big difference, I mean, in every wreck that there is, there's always technical reasons why it happened and there's you know various other things but the big difference in Lac Megantic was that the people who lived there didn't buy the railroad story that was the key thing the the people who lived there the they they saw through the attempt to just you know say well every you know on our part we did all the right things and there was these you know, a couple of individuals and they should be locked up and in, in jail and the key should be thrown away. And so as a result of that, and because I already had established a little bit of a relationship with um, uh, um, the attorney, a guy named Tom Wolf, uh, uh, you know, the RWU sent me up to the town where they were having a, a big local rally and the big local rally was about the issue of the resumption of the shipments of volatile oil through the town, which the, at the railroad at the time was called the MMA, the Montreal, Maine and Atlantic. And they had, they had uh, you know, made overtures to start running the trains again. Um, and about uh, a thousand people uh, were in the streets that day. Uh, it was my first chance to meet most of the primary activists in the community and the coalition, many of whom you've already, or some of whom you've already met. Um, and uh, that was the beginning of, of my, uh, well, it was our objective to organize solidarity, to or and to find out what was possible, right? how we could tie the defense of these guys to the questions of what were the, you know, the real reasons why this disaster took place, how we could make sure that stuff like that didn't happen in the future. It was really important because the point was is that we had to figure out how, you know, I mean, left to their own devices, these things would just be done over and over again. So because there are other things to talk about, I'll try and shorten it up a little bit, but to say that, you know, we didn't want a criminal trial to take place for these guys but as as it happened as a matter of fact as it happened it actually turned out to be 
or let's say it had a silver lining. And the silver lining is, is that a lot of stuff came out about the practices of the railroad that would probably still never have seen the light of day uh, if it hadn't been for uh, the trial. And uh, um, uh, I would say that you know, uh, the government in its prosecution, and they were basically, they were going to basically throw these three guys uh, in prison for the rest of their lives. The government had 40 witnesses. And I didn't attend the whole trial by any means, but I covered it and I, and, and I was able to be there for uh, different parts of it. And the, every single one of the government's witnesses spilled the beans on some you know, nefarious or shoddy or uh, you know, bad practice, uh, uh, things that we would never have known otherwise. You know, even if we had gotten the charges dropped you know, earlier on, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have known those things. I'll give you an example. One, I mean, this is only one of several, but um, uh, so everybody knows that the cargo on these 72 cars were, was Bakken crude oil, which is a volatile explosive um, uh, petroleum. And there, uh, it, by the way, it's, it's very heavy. Well, so as a result, there are rules about the loading of the cars, the tankers that that um, were used for this. And that meant that the cars by regulation could only be filled to a certain level based upon weight. But because there was no oversight, no practical oversight, the um, the um, the people who were involved in the filling of them were just railroad workers. They were people on the job and they were under pressure to not send a tanker out half full. You know, that's like stupid, right? That's stupid. You know, you got this capacity and you're not using it. So instead what they would do would overfill them. And we would only have known that this was a thing that was going on if it hadn't been for that aspect of the trial. And of course, the overfilling of the cars not only made them potentially more explosive, but it also meant that even their woefully inadequate requirements, their woefully inadequate safety uh, standards were uh, circumvented because now they weighed more than they were supposed to weigh. Uh, which changed their dynamics and changed the way that they, you know, uh, you know, function. So that was an example of that. And, you know, there were some things that already had come out in the reports, the investigative reports, the, the fact that the lead locomotive was defective, that it was known defective, that it was reported defective, that the workers had asked to put it in a different position. And the railroad said, no, we're just not going to do that. Um, and just many, many, many other things. There were so many of them. I mean, it was just a shocking, even for us, to some extent, we were pretty shocked. I mean, we were shocked by the fact that, uh, uh, that they were under instruction not to apply air brakes to the cars. Um, uh, the very first thing I noticed when I drove into the town was that there was a derail protected siding at the top of the grade before the town that couldn't be used and it couldn't be used for two reasons. One was they'd made the train purposefully too long and second they had leased out all of that space to uh, other uh, carriers and whatnot. So it was occupied. So what that meant in practice, everything that they did made it more dangerous. And everybody knew that that was a problem. They'd made it so long that in the town before Lac Megantic, there's a series of road crossings. And according to standard practice, you would pull a train up and you would cut it so that it split the crossing so that people could drive their cars back and forth through the crossings. But in this case, because they insisted on sending the train out with only one person on the crew, that could not be done. And what it meant in practice was that it forced this overlong, over heavy 
dangerous training in all kinds of ways onto the grade, which it wouldn't have had to have been. And the infrastructure was there to protect it, but they wouldn't use it. And we could go on and on about that. But uh, uh, the, the, the fact was that, I mean, one of the reasons why we know as much as we do about the Lakmagantic case is because they're, you know, the people in that community demanded uh, more information. The trial went forward and information came out as a result of that. And I would not in any way suggest that our defense efforts were that important in the context of things. So we, hopefully we managed to spread the word, uh, but it was really the people of that region that were the heroes. They were the ones that demanded, you know, uh, that the information come out and they were the ones that acquitted the guys that, um, to, which set the stage for uh, to be able to make it clear that you can't just create multiple bad practices and then blame it on the last guy. Um, so um, I, do I don't know. If you, do you feel that it's fair to say that if that is happening in Canada, that it is likely happening here or are there protections to prevent something like that from happening here? Well, it's hard to say, except that I can tell you this, that we know for an absolute fact is that each year, at least for the next four, I'm not sure after that, wouldn't be surprised if it was still true, but at least the next four years after the wreck in Lac Megantic, there were more runaway trains in Canada. So the, in spite of this town being destroyed and all these people killed and all their, the government insisting that they were at the switch and they knew what they were doing and they, you know, the guilty were being punished and all that, they had an out of control situation. Um, uh, my inclination is, is that it was a little wilder up there. It was wilder for a, a few reasons. One of them was that that the government at that time were kind of like the pioneers in deregulating the industry and taking rules off and letting cowboy kinds of attitudes go on. Um, and it also had, you know, maybe I, you could argue a lot more natural resources kind of stuff. So it tended to happen in places that were away from communities and things like that. Uh, I don't know if you all have other questions along those lines. Let me just check real quick here. I made a note for myself. Um, well, Rosemary uh, always likes to point out that, you know, every month we're, we're hearing about railroad workers who have died. So. Well, absolutely. And, and that's, you know, real, a real personal thing for us, of course, but, uh, the, the anti-regulatory environment that was part of taking away long-standing, we used to say, well, we didn't say it, the managers always told us this. They always said the safety rules are written in blood. The, the point was that we don't have rules for just arbitrary reasons. They're, you know, they were in place for that, but uh, the, the, uh, uh, government that had been in place in, there in Canada had started uh, what uh, inspired the uh, Trump administration with their notion of anytime you want a regulation, you have to remove two or three others. Well, they had been doing that in Canada. And of course, that's such an arbitrary thing. You know, it's like we don't even have to look at the history of the regulation, but uh, I used to have this conversation with Tom Walsh. Um, one of the questions was, would, why would somebody, an example would be Tom Harding, an experienced railroad or guy who'd been there for years and had a family history or whatever. Why would somebody like that continue to work for an outfit like Ed Burkhart's MMA? Ed Burkhart was the billionaire uh, owner and one who had, decided on all the policies that led to the wreck and uh, he was also involved in another town uh, that had been destroyed by an explosion of one of his trains but that was in the United States 
he actually was lauded up until the time of the Megantic wreck as a hero of the industry in terms of his lean, mean practices and uh, his, you know, streamlining things and making it possible for them, them to be more profitable in that way. But the answer was that if you came to work tomorrow, any of you, whatever your jobs were, and when you came to work, your boss said, you know, that thing that we used to do that was, you know, kind of safe or whatever, well, we've decided we're not going to do that anymore. And you go, okay, well, uh, I need this job and I'm not ready to move. And so whatever. And then you come in tomorrow and the exact same thing happens. You know, that other thing, we don't do that either. And the next day and the next day and the next day. And as long as you don't say, that's it, I'm out of here. The, the effect is that you, it's, it's almost like a kind of a Stockholm syndrome. It, it, you know, you come to increasingly identify with, okay, well, I, you know, the boss tells us that this is okay, then I guess it's okay. We didn't used to think it was okay, but I guess it's okay. Um, and that's a process that is a problem. But uh, anyway, that's the, the main thing about Megantic is number one is, is that the, all of the stakeholders have to be part of the, the way that we ensure that it's safe. And that means not just the managers and the owners and not just the regulators. It means the people in the communities and it means the people in the workforce. They all have to be included. And to this day, the people of Megantic and you, you've spoken with some of them, uh, they have two big concerns and they ask people like you to, to back them up. One is that they you continue to press for the bypass, the bypass around the community, you know, the community, uh, because, you know, two thirds of the people who live there are, are victims of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And every time a train goes right through the center of town and screeches on the rail and everything, they are, they relive some trauma. Um, another of the things is they have said consistently, and they still say, there's never been a full public inquiry into the real causes. And, and, and you know, even with the trial, even though the guys were acquitted of the specific criminal charges that they were uh, accused of, the government walked away basically saying, yeah, well, you know, we've gone into this and, you know, those guys, they, you know, they did some bad things and the industry, they basically, and, and, you know, we've changed some regulations and for a period of time, you know, we required two people on the crew and things like that. But as one of your uh, members there had said, they're still having an increase in wrecks there. Uh, and people getting killed there. And so that's a, a full public inquiry is still something that the world needs to demand from the Canadian government in behalf of the people in Megantic and for our own uh, reasons as well. Uh, now, uh, I don't know if you want to talk some about that now, but you had asked me to speak a little bit about LNG, and I can do that if you want. Uh, yeah, um, in terms of what should we be, well, a couple of things. I'd like to know what uh, regulations or what legislation that you would suggest that we press for, and then what, what is coming with, with the LNG? What, what are some of the hazards that we really need to be aware of in terms of rolling through our communities? I had a conversation with, um, an attorney, an, a FOIA, he, he worked in the FOIA department in uh, the State Emergency Response Commission, the Illinois mm -hmm. State. And he said that there's a list of over 300 hazardous materials, which is really closer to 400 when I looked, that um, are rolling through our communities at any given point in time. So, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, that, this is perhaps one of those areas where we will have some separation between us in that I'm a railroader. I believe we can transport products safely. 
as long as we're given the resources and the tools we need to do that, we, right. we, I do agree with you, you know, there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we, we don't, we don't have a knee jerk notion of, well, let's just stop moving hazardous materials or something. And I know that's not what you mean, but, but, uh, it is a big concern for us. And, and we do think that, um, the, you know, the lion, the captains of our industry, are not taking it seriously. They have transformed their, that one of the things that's happened is that hedge funds have kind of taken over the railroads. This is another whole conversation we could have, but the result is, is that instead of any kind of long-term thinking or any kind of developmental or, you know, that there's a husbanding of resources and protections and things like that, the, the whole managerial class of the railroads are focused on the next quarter and two quarters and the profit sheet. And uh, you all have probably heard of the um, managerial uh, program called Precision Scheduled Railroading. I don't know if you've talked about that, but it's now the subject of congressional inquiries. And, and um, uh you know, it's not precision, it's not scheduled, and it's not railroading. But what it is, is a short term, very profitable way of, of operating that basically is um, cutting things to the bone so that um, it looks good to stockholders, but doesn't have any real, um, it doesn't protect the safe nature of the transportation network. Uh, so PSR would certainly be one thing that we would ask for people to speak out on and to oppose, uh, to call for the railroads to abandon that. There's not a particular piece of legislation about that, uh, but the regulators need to really look at it. And, and what we, you know, as, as citizens have to do is we have to say that, uh, you know, the railroads, used to be understood to be a public utility. And to this day, the railroads, when they enter into legal things and regulatory things and everything, like, they'll say, well, we're a public utility. And then all the rest of the time, they say, no, we're a private business and we get to do whatever we want. It, it has to be understood that we have too much as a people, we have too much invested and too much at stake in uh, the, the the vast potential and the reality of the rail network in this country. So much of our own resources, so much of our own money, so much of our own blood is, is invested in that. But we have a stake in it. We have a right to say that these things should be, you know, that there's an, an important public interest in the way that these things are done. There is another couple of pieces of legislation, one in particular that I'll, I want to talk, but I was going to put them towards the end because I think they are more about the how we can do the mode shift stuff. Quickly on LNG, liquid national natural gas. Um, you all probably have had some conversations about this. The, you know, obviously people who know the story of, of Bach and Crude and whatnot, they, they understand some of the, the issues that are involved here. But liquid natural gas is not only more potentially destructive, uh, it also is harder to or requires more care to safely transport. Uh, one of the main things about it is that it, it doesn't just require containment, it also requires really cold temperatures and it has to have the the equipment has to be you know really specialized and this is one of these kind of areas we're running into this on a number of things with rail which is just because you now suddenly are able to do a thing doesn't mean that you should when i say able i mean technically uh, and one aspect of that is making longer and longer and longer trains so now, technically, you can do it because they know how to do distributed power and they know how to do various other technical things that that um, solve problems from the past. That doesn't mean that you should do it just because you can do it. And it also doesn't mean that you've done all of the research. In Lac Megantic, 
when the MMA was going out and telling the communities and all the neighborhoods and the regulators that they had that they were going to do this new kind of shipments, you know, they'd said, well, we've considered this and we've considered that and we've considered that. They didn't have a fire plan. They had no fire plan, even though, and then, you know, they're making these big presentations and things. It's like, we're going to move unit trains longer than ever before of the most explosive stuff. And we have no fire plan. Well, this is one of those, you know, those kind of things. One of the things, if you make a train longer and longer and longer, you know, the big question that you have to answer is, have you studied all of the dynamics, all the train dynamics and things? Have you studied to make sure that you haven't actually created a brand new, never before seen problem that nobody's, you know, ever seen on railroads before? Um, anyway, uh, so back on the LNG, uh, you may know that there's some scandal associated with the advancements of LNG shipments. Uh, one of them is, is that the early special permits for moving uh, uh, LNG by rail went to uh, 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 hedge funds that, uh, that were providing loans and then um, erasing the loans to Donald Trump and his companies. And then they got special permits to start doing this. And then Trump signed uh, um, an executive order in April of 2019 that basically opened the door uh, for, you know, doing these shipments of LNG by rail all across the country. So, that doesn't prove anything. That doesn't prove about, that has nothing to say about the safety part, but it is an interesting coincidence that, uh, that uh, all of a sudden for the first time, we're talking about doing this new in, you know, not completely properly studied, not completely properly prepared kind of transport uh, in a particular political context. You um, said that the permitting is done through the hedge funds. I, I didn't quite understand that. Well, that no, there are two. In, there were two companies. Uh, I think one was called New Fortress, and the other one was called Doral. Or something. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but the, pretty easily available in articles that are available uh, in the public. Um, that Fortress, Fortress. Uh, uh, I can't, I can't think of the full name, but at, it, ironically or not ironically, uh, Fortress used to own the um, central, uh, central Maine in Quebec, which was the U.S. portion of that line that the Lac Megantic wreck took place on. Uh, but they have since sold it, and now that is all owned by Canadian Pacific again, CP Rail. Uh, but so it's a really it's a small club it's a real small club and uh, that they own rail operations and they own natural gas operations and they want to take advantage of those things um, and they use their political influence and their economic clout to be able to get special consideration for those things so so it was one of those things that needs to be out into the public sphere and again I would not say here that we can't move LNG by rail. I, I would say that it's our position that if we need to transport it, it's better to move it by rail than to build a brand new permanent infrastructure like pipelines for that purpose. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons why that would be less good, but uh, Right now, we don't think that there's been adequate protection. We don't think that there's been adequate uh, research and things that need to be done to make sure that those things are done safely. And one of the problems, and it's a problem with Bakken and it's a problem with LNG and other products is that the episodic nature of those, those products, episodic, I mean, mar you know, the market decides. So for a period of time, it's not profitable to ship and crude 
and everybody thinks, oh, it's all gone away. It hasn't gone away. Sometimes they're storing it in rail cars. Sometimes they're doing, you know, there's various different things. And then when the market price changes internationally, all of a sudden they start moving it again. And nobody's prepared for that because it hasn't been moved for a period of time. And this would be true in the LNG as well. So um, the, the, those are concerns that, uh, you know, the, in the industry, we are concerned that we think that this is premature, that it hasn't been properly prepared. Uh, I would like to point out for people who, that for this is, you know, a lot of people have understood that there's a, uh, you know, that LNG is greener, that LNG is, um, you know, better for the environment. And actually, that's not true. It's not true if you actually uh, go the whole supply chain of the whole process that's involved in the production of LNG. It may burn cleaner, and that's probably true. But the whole process of getting it is actually worse. It's actually worse than coal. So, uh, you know, Outfits like the Florida East Coast that were doing some of these shipments, you know, do a whole greenwash thing on the movement of LNG, but it's, it's one that actually uh, doesn't pass the sniff test. Anyway, we think that um, uh, that rail can be, needs to be, should be the green transportation future. And, it, and we need to mode shift to that if we're gonna solve all these other problems that we've already been talking about here, including the gridlock and the climate change and the disconnected communities and, the, and the other things. But there are some problems looming and you're interested in some things you can work on. One of them is that you may have recently heard that, um, the, uh, the, an arbitration process has the, has ordered the rail unions, the unions representing rail workers, to negotiate crew consist on the job, and this is a huge setback for rail safety, and it's a setback for people in the industry as well. The uh, the industry has said all along that the question of whether there's single crew trains or even robot trains is not one for a public safety. It is one of labor contracts. And now they have won at this, at this level, ordering that the rail unions treat the question of crew consist, whether there's only one person on the train as strictly a contractual question on the job. The rail unions have opposed this. They've said this is wrong, this is bad, this is dangerous, that they want regulation, they want, uh, they want it to be law, that you don't send a train out like they did in Lac Megantic with a single person on it. Uh, but now they have been ordered to um, treat it as just another contractual bargaining question. And even in the very best of, of cases where, let's say, for example, they successfully bargain to have more than one person on the crew, they will have to pay for that. They will differentially have to pay for that themselves. So that even though all of us in this room, we could all say, we don't want single crew trains, but the only people who would actually have to pay with their lives and their safety and their money and their benefits and their careers and their quality of life will be the people on the train, nobody else. They have to, they have to be the, the thin blue line or whatever you want to call it that stands between us and robot trains or uh, uh, you know, single person crews. So I would ask people to you know, look for ways to be able to call politicians uh, uh, out on this, to, that, that they need to pass legislation on this question. Uh, because it's something that's all, I mean, it's, you know, they can say the train has left the station. Uh, it's, it's a thing and it is going to be a problem. And, and, you know, in your case, in your community, you've really focused a lot on the hazardous waste things. But I would argue to you that 
every train is more unsafe, regardless of what its cargo is, if your people who are working on it are working in bad conditions, if they're working by themselves, if they're uh, overtired, overstressed, not adequately trained, you know, any of those kinds of questions, that makes all the trains more, more problematic. Yes, we, we um, I, I guess I want to say uh, Chuck Frank, I'm not sure if he's on this call or not, but um, we, we have, you know, through his input and some input put, put from other people, we've changed the, uh, the name of this campaign and the name of the campaign is Rail Safety. It's, it's not focusing, I mean, mm -hmm. hazardous materials, of course, yeah. are part of that, um, but we're focusing on rail safety. Very good. Well, I have a one last ask of you. This is a pretty new thing. Um, there is a new bill that doesn't have a number yet. Uh, it is sponsored by Senators Casey of Pennsylvania and Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. And in the House, it has sponsor, uh, primary sponsors, Judy Garcia in the fourth district out of Chicago. And it, it is, uh, they, they say that it can be referred to as the uh, Green Rail Locomotives Act of 2021. Now, there are plenty of people in the environmental movement who have held out, as I have, for electrification and for zero emission power uh, for our trains and things like that. The unfortunate reality of it is that none of those things, even if we were wildly successful at, at the policy side of it, can quickly come to bear and to make th the, the impact of the equipment um, in the near term. And while that's going on, there are right now existing incentives in the industry to keep the worst diesel locomotives in service, by which I mean tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier three, the, the worst actors that, that they actually have uh, economic incentives to keep that equipment going. It's kind of like the situation in Lac Megantic, where the lead locomotive that had the defects had had improper repairs done to it, even though it was way past its sell-by date. And those, those uh, ways of keeping it going at all costs were actually one of the proximate causes of the wreck because they caused the locomotive to catch fire. They turned the locomotive off. When the locomotive was off, the compressor didn't run anymore because of the policy to not have air brakes on the train. There was nothing to restrain the train, et cetera. So this new legislation, it, uh, is important on a whole bunch of levels. And one of them is, is that it would immediately work to incentivize carrot and stick, uh, the replacement of the worst power that's out there on the trains today, uh, by which I mean emissions, by which I mean uh, consumption, fuel consumption, and just general condition and general, uh, and for the quality of life of the people that work there and, uh, and whatnot replacing it with the state of the art, which is available and which will immediately make right away a, a big improvement. Uh, it's not the improvement that we need, but it's a big improvement. And the bill includes ratchets that basically immediately kick in as the newer technologies become available. When hydrogen is a ready for prime time thing, hydrogen will automatically with the passage of this bill be the way that the power will be will be done uh, furthermore it it protects the um, uh, sort of like the quality of life and the uh, aspects of some of the other aspects that are more critical to the um, the way that the locomotives are are put together uh, make sure that their content is made in this country, make sure that the people who do it have protections that allow them to speak up when they see problems. That's all in this bill. Uh, I, there is, there's not a number yet because it hasn't actually been, you know, uh, entered, but it does have the sponsors, as I said. Uh, as soon as there's a further development on that, I will forward it to you. But the uh, Green Rail Locomotives Act of 2021 
is something that I would ask you to consider uh, in your work as something that will make the rails safer, better. Uh, it's an act of solidarity. It's an act of uh, protection for our, um, you know, our, our environment. And it's basically sets the stage legislatively so that we can make this transformation as part of this business of making the rail the green transportation future. I think you have somebody with their hand up there. Uh, um, Robin Weller. Yeah, uh, it's me. Uh, um, quick question, Fritz. Um, can we already be reaching out to our senators and um, representatives and bringing up this bill by name only since it doesn't have its numbering yet? I, I'm sure you can. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not versed enough on the procedures in the, in the House and the Senate in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, everybody's focused on the infrastructure bill at this particular moment. Right. Uh, uh, and I actually reached out to uh, one of my um, uh, colleagues. He's actually the president of uh, of a, a local union that organizes the biggest locomotive plant in the world in Erie, Pennsylvania, to ask him some questions about this. And you heard what I what I heard, which is that it has the sponsors. It the language has been carefully you know, developed with a lot of different stakeholders. And uh, I guess they're into the tactics now of exactly when and how and all that. Um, well, it's certainly something that we can bring to the attention of our legislators mm -hmm. and, um, and ask them that we would like them to support that. We right. can definitely do right. that. And then we can keep an eye out for when it's introduced and right. um, mm -hmm. Start making some noise about it once it is will, introduced. You will be among the first to know as soon as I have that information. Um, Fritz, Gloria? without getting too far into the weeds, could, could you explain to me why this defective locomotive, uh, why that, that, so it had to be turned off because it was defective and a better operating locomotive would have been left running and yeah. then would not have released the air. Yeah, absolutely. And that's you're referring to the lac megantic situation. Uh, so the lac megantic consist had, am I right? Three locomotives. In other words, it needed three locomotives to pull a, the weight of the of the Bakken. And uh, oh, but, uh, let me see here. I'm going to see if I can do this while I'm answering you. This. Let me see if I can share this. Uh, Jerry, can I share a screen? Do you know if I can do that? Yeah, we just need to make you a co-host. Okay, because I, I mean, I, but it isn't really going to help. I, it was, I was just the answer. One of the people in the comments asked about uh, having Googled the bill. Um, and uh, the bill says this act may be cited as the Green Rail Locomotives Act of 2021. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's not like on a website or something at this point, um, you know. But as I say, I'll forward you this information as soon as that becomes available. Or yeah, you are a co-host now. So you okay, to well, I, I can, maybe I can put it up. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Uh, um, uh, crud. There. Let's try that. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yes. All right. So this is, as you can see, says a bill to phase out older freight locomotives, decrease emissions from passenger freight locomotives, establish a grant program, facilitate the upgrade. Anyway, that's, you know, that's what I've got. Uh, and uh, I think the fact that, you know, Senators Casey and, and Sanders are willing to be sponsors for it is pretty important, um, especially in the light of the way things are now, so. Uh, but there's no, I mean, as you can see there, there's, there's nothing on there that really further uh, that gives you much further information. Now, the whole text of it, of course, goes on and on. And lots of legalese, 
uh, about how we're going to uh, upgrade the power, the grant program, and also not just the grant program, but getting rid of the previous uh, in economic incentives for them to keep the, the bad locomotives in power, which brings us back to the question of um, what happened in Megantic. So that locomotive had in its prime mover, in its engine, um, uh, it was a crack or what, anyway, it had a substantial problem where it would leak oil and then the oil would catch fire. And they had made an improper repair on it using epoxy. And they had, um, um, anyway, they, 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 there's, a, there's a thing that happens. I've even had it happen on trains I was operating, uh, or not that I was operating, but trains that I followed called a stack fire. And there are a few different kinds of conditions that can create it. Usually what it happens is the engine is, been improperly maintained and it spews tiny particles of diesel oil out of the smokestack. And when they descend, in a lot of cases, they'll just start to drip down the insides of the stack. And when they do that, if they actually um, then hit the hot engine block, they can catch fire or they can catch fire on the wayside. I, I remember I followed a freight train through New Jersey one time that had set miles of the track side on fire because it was doing that. Um, but um, uh, so in this case, they made an improper repair. This is some of the stuff that we learned for the investigation of the wreck. And uh, they had also improperly wired the, um, what do you call it? The, basically the fail safe, the fail safe with regard to the brakes that were supposed to uh, put the train into emergency and uh, protect things. That, so it had those two different kinds of problems. And they, I guess the repair probably had, you know, worked for a while. I don't know. Anyway, the, but the, one of the guys that was one of the witnesses in the case, he testified that when they made up the consist, when they put the locomotives together for that train, they that they were ordered to put that locomotive in the lead position. And he and some of the other people on the job went to the manager and said, don't do this. Don't let's let, don't not only don't do this, but let us right now, we'll just switch it around. If we switch it around, because they had a rule, their rule was that when they'd get to their destination, they would shut down the trailing locomotives and leave only the lead locomotive running. Which by the way, if they'd listened to these guys, is another of the reasons why this wreck would have never happened. So um, they, um, they said, don't do this. And he, I don't know if he actually made a call or not, but in any event, he said, no, I can't. I don't have authority to have you do that. Uh, you just, you know, that's, you, you can't uh, make the switch. And so the lead locomotive was defective and it was defective in a way that even affect power. The as a matter of fact, another of the things that came out, it wasn't that important in the greater scheme of things was that Tom Harding called repeatedly on the radio and reported out that you know, he was having power problems that uh, uh, he, he didn't have as much power as he was supposed to. And it was taking longer. The trip was taking longer. I, I, I might be wrong about this, but I want to say that the trip should have taken like six hours. Instead, it took over eight. Um, and so there, I mean, there was no question about that. This was a, a locomotive that should not have been in service, but it was cheaper for the MMA to operate this way. And they did it. And because they did it, and because they had the rule that you kept the lead locomotive online and not the trailing ones, you know, on, on that's what precipitated the fire. That's what precipitated shutting down the compressor. That's what shut, you know, precipitated the, you know, the brakes releasing. All these different things were connected. And I mean, there, you know, half a dozen at least things that if they had done them, 
the way that they should have done them, pr best practices, proper practices, the wreck wouldn't have taken place. But, um, so. I, I, I attended that conference, Fritz, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, your port, it was an all day conference and there were different speakers and your portion was talking about the insane scheduling of work. Yeah, yeah that was a big, can you give a highlight of some of those uh, issues? Yeah, the, the scheduling is of course still a problem. It's, uh, it's not, I mean, it, they've, they've walked it back just a little bit on at least on the Amtrak side. I, I can't speak as much for the freight side. The freight side is really operates a little differently because they generally don't have schedules at all. So, uh, you know, whereas I can complain to you about passenger side schedules that are draconian bad schedules, at least it's a schedule, you know, as opposed to the way that they generally do freight. Um, and you're right, that was my presentation. And, and I still, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, thankfully, I don't personally run trains right now. But I, I every day worry about my coworkers and their fatigue. Well, one of the things I, I thought I remembered is that you said, all right, so there's some regulations that they have to have a certain num of number of hours off. But that means they have to go home, see their families, have dinner, see their wife, go to sleep. But then they can be called and have that off time interrupted with a telephone call at two in the morning to tell them either they are or they are not due at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, they, they have so, a mandated legal amount of rest, but that legal amount of rest can be interrupted by what they call a, a, a short call or something. In other words, like call you up, be here at five, click. Yeah. But now you're awake, right? And it's this is your, you know, your five hours after you've driven home and you've done all the other things and everything like that. Uh, we've been pressing for a long time for a much longer mandatory and uninterrupted thing. But frankly, I don't know whether you would remember this or not, but the big problem for us was not even so much the question of did you have enough time? It was more about how they put the schedules together. Uh, and what they had done is they had, they had um, stopped the long-term practice where they would get in a big room and they'd say, these are all the trains we need to run. And, and, you know, we're willing to couple this train with this train and have all the guys from the union in there and, you know, have this back and forth about, well, don't put this with this because this one's always late and this one has a problem. And the, so there's a paper schedule, but it doesn't actually, it's not what actually happens in the real world. They said, we won't do that anymore. We'll just feed it into the computer and the computer will be programmed to optimize for our benefit of our being, you know, the manager's efficiency and costs and things like that. And so for the first time, you'd start to have schedules that just, you know, I mean, in your own life, if you could imagine where, you know, there was examples of this where you'd go to work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you work a train to New York, you'd be in New York, like, in Penn Station, New York for four and a half, five hours or something or other. And then, and by which I mean, there's no place for you to have a proper rest and then work a train back and get back at like, and like 11 o'clock the next day or something or other. So uh, now you've been away for all that time at the, you know, what we know scientifically is the worst cycles, the worst times a day and everything like that and then do that even though i mean you know do that and then couple it with other schedules for the other days of the week that would mean that you still were not getting any recovery or, or whatever like that and a lot of times they would come up with you know they'd come up with all kinds of excuses and they'd say well you know uh you have these schedules for you know, four days, but then you'll have three days off or something like that. Didn't happen very much, but sometimes they would. And, and say, well, you know, that's great on the day off. But if you're on your third day 
of 12 hours of overnight, that doesn't help you. It helps you not one iota in terms of your ability to be ready to go to work. So anyway, I thank you for remembering that. Um, but that's it's still a problem. It's and it's it's worse for it's worse under PSR. It's worse under PSR because they've furloughed. There's a recent article in Trains Magazine where they documented this under PSR across all the railroads. They've actually sloughed off an entire railroad's worth of employees, tens of thousands of people, put them out of work. And the remainder of them are then, I mean, you all have probably seen this in other businesses that you deal with and things where they're like now, especially as different parts of the economy are rolling again, a smaller number of people are having to do all the work. Um, and you can imagine how that works out. And, and another thing I, I was wondering, can you tell us, I always have trouble finding the actual who makes the decisions of the National Railroad Administration? Now they're under the Department of Transportation, but there are all these different councils and breakdowns. Who actually makes the railroad rules? I know Congress can control them, mm -hmm. but what is the agency under Department of Transportation? Well, the Federal Railroad Administration is under the Department of Transportation uh, and that's the main regulatory body, mm -hmm. uh, the FRA. The, uh, there are other, you know, agencies of government that in one respect or another sometimes have something to do with it. For example, the hours of service laws that you referred to there that have to do with rest and things like that. Uh, and uh, then there's safety things. Some safety things are actually under OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Most of them are under the FRA, but some of them are under OSHA. And, and um, what's the committee under FRA? Because I looked on their website, there are right. a ton of committees. Yeah, well, uh, and and that's true. It's divided up, but I, I'm not sure exactly where, what you're trying to get to. Do you want to know who makes the regulations? Yes. That those are all code of federal regulations things. So they're legislation. Uh, the FRA does what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking, and this is sort of pertinent to our conversation in this regard because in October. I'm pretty sure of 2016, the FRA was under unprecedented pressure uh, from the public to hold a public hearing on the question of crew consist. On this, it flowed out of the Lac Megantic stuff. They had, they were under pressure to have a rule that would require more than one person on the train, and so they held what was. They put out what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking, and then they had a public hearing, and I actually testified at that hearing, and um, the and there was also uh, maybe some of you had some involvement in this. There were public comments. You could at, you could enter into the record your public comments and things on this, and many many people did, and then as we know in November there was a presidential election. And immediately after that, it was only a month after they'd had the hearing, the FRA made their decision that they uh, were not going to implement the new rule. So uh, there was a pretty much of a direct connection there between the what what the dynamic of what was going to happen, which was we were going to have an FRA rule that required more than one person on the train, and then we lost it. So, oh, they send they send suggested rules to Congress, though, and Congress makes the legislation. But they are guided, aren't they, by the FRA recommendations? Well, the Code of Federal Regulations, which is where the um, you know the agencies put out their rules and in the legislation. I mean, it's sort of a two part process. That you know, their legislation, like the one that I was. Um, promoting with you about the green locomotives uh, would have to pass Congress. 
and then aspects of it would be administered by the FRA and other, I mean, you can even see on the, on the screen there, it's talking about, it says the standard set for the cleanest available locomotive by the administrator, and it cites the part of the United States code. And that's a, an important part of this legislation, which is like, we're not just talking about what the standard today is, we're talking about in, you know, next year and the year after that and the year after that and the year after that, what's the, you know, what's the cleanest available? So doesn't FRA do isn't aren't they involved in the rulemaking and then OIRA is the um, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs? Don't they do the final approval? Is that right or no? That's not familiar to me. I'm not saying that they play no role in that. Uh, you know, but that's not immediately familiar to me. Uh, what I mostly understand is this question of the, what they call the, you know, the notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, uh, th where they, they basically say, we're considering implementing this new rule. And this is your window in which you can argue that we shouldn't do that, or we should change it, or we should, you know, whatever. Are there any other questions? Well, Fritz, thank you so much for all the information that you have shared with us. And um, I would greatly appreciate it if you, if you have a moment, if you might be able to um, send me in maybe a PDF of that legislation that we could disseminate to members and ask them to uh, show their elected officials. Uh, sure, we'll do that, but I'm gonna hold off and make sure that I don't send out something that is not the final draft, if you oh, know what I mean, you yes. know what I mean? So yeah. I wanna make sure that, that's why I'm like, hey, you know, tell me when it's got a number, tell me what, you know, all that, cause I don't wanna, uh, I mean, it, this is a hard enough process as it is without being accused of putting out inaccurate information or whatever, you know, but um, so. Um, I certainly will do that as soon as I have an official thing, you know, um, yeah. so. Thank, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Big round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for well, your seriousness well, and, and, and your advocacy. And, you know, like, I mean, I'm a rail advocate, but I also live next to the railroad. So I need it to protect my community as well. So, um, well, so. We're, we're, we're doing our best to support you, the railroad workers and, and the communities that, that are living near this. And I'll tell you, it, it's hard trying to get to the bottom of the issue, you know, like it is. E even just with, you know, the local emergency response versus the state emergency response, they're both, you know, pointing both ways for me. So I just FOIA'd them both and I'm trying to see what kind of information I can get um, so that we can kind of plan our, um, our you know, what direction we're gonna go in here. Uh, Tom has had his hand raised. Hi there, uh, Fritz. Uh, my name is Tom Lee and this has been an absolutely terrific presentation. I thank you for your expertise and your time and your passion. Do I misunderstand you when you said, I thought you said that potentially rail can be the most safe means of transportation? Is that what you said? Well, I, I said it in a couple of different ways. I said, I think it can be the safe green transportation future. I also said that I believe that we can safely transport most, I won't say all, most hazardous materials we know there are there are best practices that will allow us to do that if the, you had to, to list make, just let's say three or four things that we could focus on um to make that happen make rail the epitome of safety what would what would those three or four things be i I know I've heard or I've read 
somewhere that the fronts and backs of these rail cars are particularly vulnerable. Is that something we should be focusing on? Uh, I think that would be a very specific, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's a very specific thing. It would be specific to the equipment. And as you okay. probably what, know, there's a lot of picture, different specialized What are the three equipment. or four things that we could be focusing or that the general public could be focusing on? I, I think, first of all, it has to do with making sure that there are uh, trained, skilled, capable of judgment human beings on there. Um, and more than one, that would be the, probably the most important of all, uh, because even in the event that the bad thing happens, you need human beings that know what they're doing there to make it as least bad as can, as is possible. Uh, another would be, and I, this is actually a little bit more amorphous, it's more difficult, but uh, we have to do something to rein in the financial strip mining of the industry. The, the, the hedge fund, you know, where basically railroads like the CSX now are basically hedge funds with a side business as transportation. It really every decision, every important decision is about financial manipulation of things and not I mean, let, we'll get back to this question of public utility. Is it a public utility? Is it about transportation or is it just about stockholders? And so, and I don't know, that probably doesn't really give you the answer you want, but the profit motive part of it is if, if you allow the people who make the decisions to do anything that they want to do, as long as it makes money, that's exactly what happened in Lac-Megantic. What happened in Lac Megantic was people got in charge that got to, to do anything they wanted as long as it was cheaper and and you know more lucrative, yeah. regardless of the consequences. Three and four. Uh, I would say that uh, one of them is the, the keep up of the infrastructure. I mm. didn't get a chance to hear you when you had your, your guests from Megantic, but I know a very important question to them that they always raise is they go out and they look and they don't think the infrastructure, the track, things like that have been kept up to the top standards. Uh, that's very important to me as well. I've been involved in a lot of... Uh, the proceedings that come after derailments, things like that. I've, uh, uh, and what I know is that this problem, like the one about the locomotive in Lac Megantic and uh, one other ones that I experienced in Washington, D.C., uh, are all problems that have to do with them trying to do less than the proper maintenance. I, I don't know if this probably doesn't count as irony. I don't know, but I had just returned uh, this was four years ago, I think, from Lac Megantic, the night before the 1st of May. I had just gotten in and I'd gone to sleep and I got a call in the early morning and we had a derailment right in the middle of Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, I raced out there with a couple of my colleagues and, and uh, we got there and it had come because... Uh, of a, a maintenance problem on an axle on one of the cars and it caused this the the train had actually derailed but kept moving for a period of time when it finally did derail it you know derailed seven cars some of which had pretty nasty stuff in it but not as bad as megantic or other places like that and it was only luck that that happened in the way that it did. It was within rock throwing distance of taking out the entire infrastructure of the Rhode Island Avenue Metro station and an apartment building. And it just rolled up to maintenance. It just rolled up to proper standards of, of keeping the equipment in the, in the proper way. So that would be another thing. And, you know, I don't necessarily want to, you know, say that this is the only way that this can be done but in many places in the world what they understand is that the way this has to be done is is that the rails have to be nationalized 
Um, and of course that raises all kinds of hackles with certain people, but it means it, it's the only way that you are able to have all of the stakeholders at the table. Um, I noticed in the uh, infrastructure bill that is pending right now, there's money, quite a bit of money for rail uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, it had never occurred to me, quite frankly, that uh, the government builds and maintains these rails. Is that true? I thought it was the railroads that did it. Is that not yeah, true? Well, the railroads do do it, but uh, the railroads have always figured out ways to get public money from the very beginning. You know, uh, And there's no difference in that. Uh, I, I know you've been on this call for a long time, but if you'll allow me, I'll tell a quick Sure, story. please, please. This in is Washington, D.C., there's one rail bridge and that crosses the Potomac River and it's a choke point for all freight and passenger trains in the region is, you know, a hundred miles before whatever it is, it's long distance before you have any other way to cross the Potomac River. And that bridge is, was given to the CSX. There was, a, you know, uh, owned by the, by the government was given to the CSX and the CSX, um, they did what maintenance they needed to do and stuff. But for years, they, for two years, they held up the advent of, of commuter rail service from Virginia until they could get indemnity against anything that happened on the bridge or whatever. And, uh, but fast forward to the moment, more and more people. Virginia is actually in the forefront of all the states in the country as far as their understanding of the importance of rail infrastructure and especially passenger rail. So there's big pressure on this one bridge. The most important part of which is, is that the port of Virginia down at Norfolk is one of the few places on the East Coast that can take the huge container ships that can now go through the Panama Canal all the stuff is connected. So they want to run 15 double stack trains through the city without stopping every day. But there's Amtrak trains and there's commuter trains of all these different services. And so what we've known is that we need to have more crossings so that we have redundancy, so that we have capacity, so that we can make sure that we can do this mode shift that we want to see happen. And here's the point of all this is that because there was a federal stake that, you know, there was one of the abutments of that bridge is on federal land. When they had the conversations about how they would replace it or augment it, they had to allow all the stakeholders in the room. Every other place in the country, pretty much, it's the railroad owners and the regulators, and they make all the decisions and they don't care what you think, what your community thinks. That's a but phenomenon because, that plays out in a, a lot of industries as well. Uh, one yeah. last question, this Bacton formation crude, is that particularly dangerous stuff? I'm saying it again. The Bacton formation crude that Bacton. was in yeah. the, being carried in the La Mag Magantique yeah. uh, disaster. Right. Is that a particularly dangerous kind of crude oil? It's not the worst. Well, it's it's probably the right probably the worst of the crude oil. It's not the worst hazmat, uh, but it is it is volatile and explosive. Uh, it is probably the most explosive of the um, the the crude oils. Okay. One last question, and this is probably out of your league, but I wanna, I wanna throw it out there anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, passionate about your, your cause here. Uh, and I think we, we uh, desperately need to get our act together and do something about this. I'm also uh, concerned about land-based hazmats. We've had two big explosions and fires here in Illinois within the last month and a half. One involving uh, some uh, batteries, I think it was, in Morris, Illinois, and another one in Roscoe, Illinois, I think it is. Is that right, folks? Rockton. Rockton. Rockton, Illinois. These were two disasters, both of which were land-based, not rail-based. Right. 
And I'm wondering, um, I'm just kind of opening up a hornet's nest here probably, but I'm wondering um, to what extent these land-based uh, hazardous materials pose the same kind of problems as rail-based. Um, well, they're certainly analogous in the sense that the, the, the issues of profit motive or whatever causing decisions that are not the safest decisions are still operative. The main difference is that it's pretty darn hard for there to be, as you call it, a land-based, basically meaning trucks, uh, uh, or capacity. Or you know or stationary I mean? just stuff that's stored in a factory oh somewhere. yeah yeah right well that's another thing yeah right but i'm saying in other words and of course a stationary like a, a tank or something might be worse but in general especially with the move towards longer and heavier trains it's just a question of scale yeah okay you know, um uh fritz would you uh add to your oh sorry jerry Fritz, would you add to your list uh, shorter trains and slower trains? Yeah, we, we've said for a long time that, that, I mean, this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier about just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And so there's two parts to that. One is that maybe you just shouldn't. And the other is, have you done your homework? Have you before you decide to go out and, and do this, you know, have you actually thought through the whole business for example in the in the megantic wreck where they didn't have a fire plan they had they thought they had done their you know as far as they were concerned their due diligence or whatever we can move these big long trains of bach and crude they didn't have a fire plan you know and it does make i mean especially in hindsight you, you know your mind just reels and you go oh okay for the first time you're going to move this explosive product and you're going to move a lot of it and you don't have a plan in case something happens but we don't have fire plans either specific to the transport of, of hazardous materials we yeah. there are for storage facilities but not for oh, no, things that no, are moving no, yeah but is it, I mean, public groups like yours need to, you know, demand of their public officials and of the regulators the, that um, that the people who are entrusted to do this stuff do their due diligence, you know. And those of us in the union movement, we make it our business to try to do that. Uh, but and it's one of the big differences between a workplace that has unions and one that doesn't is that the ones that don't, the people are afraid to speak up and they don't have a vehicle to speak up. But uh, those of us that, you know, are fortunate enough to have those, that opportunity, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we hold our employers accountable. Even, even union members said that they felt wary of becoming a whistleblower. They need more whistleblower protection, yeah, even absolutely. within the union. Yeah, well, the whistleblower thing is another thing. If we could have another conversation about it, but I'll just say I agree with you. Um, but it, I mean, one thing that happens with all these things is that every time there's a progressive piece of legislation, the industries then work to whittle it away and whittle it away, and eventually it becomes much less valuable. That last one, I promise. Um, I, I'm guessing it would never happen, but isn't it much safer to have a caboose and have a at one person on each end of the train? Uh, we would say so. And they'll tell you that, no, there's this, there's technology that will take care of that problem. But, uh, and I, you know, I, you know, it really kind of depends about, it depends on how long is it. It particularly depends on whether it's a unit train and uh, a unit train means you know, only one product in the whole train, you know, everything is, it's ex exactly one as opposed to a mixed consist train, which might have a little of this, a little of that. Uh, those kinds of trains for a variety of reasons tend to be a little more vulnerable to problems. The main reason why you want historically a caboose is because if the train is long enough, the engineer has 
limited ability to be able to see a defect, smoke, uh, fire, uh, something that's not on the rail, you know, things like that. And so you need people looking from both directions. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm not saying that there isn't some technology that we should adopt. I think it would be a question of appropriate technology. Uh, the replacement for the caboose is generally what they call a, uh, an EOTD, an end of train device. It's, you know, it has a radio, it has a light, it has a few, you know, thing to check how much brake pipe pressure is there. It's not really the same as having a human being back there who can be, you know, uh, available to, to, you know, be aware of things and stuff like that. But most important thing is that, like in the, in the Megantic case, because there was only one person on the train, if they had, you know, uh, had to stop on a fire or if they had, a, you know, like the crossing block, whatever, there's no way for a single person, a single person can only move a train forward. They can't move backward. They can't split it in different places. They can't get away from a danger. They can't move a, a piece of defective equipment out, set it out. Uh, and that's, and especially since, I can tell you because in the hearing on the proposed rulemaking that the FRA had, the industry was there and the industry just said straight out, they said, you know, we're looking at robot trains. We're looking at trains with nobody on them. And, the, and they also accused the Department of Transportation said, you know, it's hypocrisy that the Department of Transportation in its non-FRA section is spending millions of dollars on the development of remote control trucks. And then in the FRA, they're having a hearing about whether or not you have to have two human beings on, you know, the, these people have tremendous power, they have tremendous money and they need to be countered because they take no responsibility. As you said, it's like what happened in Megantic. There's a list this long of the things that they did to create the circumstances of that wreck. And their answer was, no, it was Tom Harding. So. Well, I've, I've learned so much tonight. I really appreciate this. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all of you. And I'm sure you have other things you want to get on to, but uh, you know, I mean, Jerry, and I, we have conversations every so often and we can get in touch. So if people have information that they would, uh, other questions or things like that, we can do that. We can make that happen. Uh, Thank you, you again, Chris. Being, uh, put on our mailing list. And you I'm sorry? Can, I said, would you mind being put on our mailing list and we can, you can. Sure, uh, that'd be fine. What yeah. we're doing. Thanks. Yes, and anything new, please send our way and, and we will uh, disseminate it. As yeah, as I absolutely will. And, uh, you know, there's always something going on, I have to say. Uh, but, uh, and I mean, the latest thing is this business of having to negotiate over the crew consist, which is a real important setback. And, uh, you know, in the sense that even under the very best circumstances where we can guarantee that there's two skilled, capable of judgment people on the train, we will have to give up all kinds of stuff in order for that to happen. And it's just not fair. It's not fair that the public safety has to get resolved on the backs of just one group of people. Uh, what word are you saying after crew? It sounds like consist. Crew consist. It's, uh, I guess that's a little bit of railroad jargon. Crew consist means how many people are on the crew. Right, but okay. are you saying C-O-N-S-I-S? S-I-S-T. Uh, cons oh, so, consist. So how many consist? Like, okay. like I say, it's jargon. It's like a train consist is, well, there's a locomotive and there's five cars and then there's a caboose. That's okay. the caboose. So what does it consist, consist of? Okay, the gotcha. crew consist. Gotcha. And we say no fewer than two. In fact, it depends on the situation. Maybe, maybe it needs more than two, but you know. Didn't it used to be like five? I mean, historically. Uh, when I started in Washington Terminal, right here in Washington, DC, as a brakeman, 
we had crews that had five. Now there's, I mean, that you have to say that's not like you're going from here to there. That's a lot of switching operations and a lot of things like that. But um, there, you really, if you're going to do any kind of switching at all, you need at least three. And the, and there's a lot of situations where there's only two. And you can technically do it with two, which is why we say no fewer than two. But it's better if there's at least three. And of course, if there's people on board or other things like that, you need more. So, because there's a lot of kinds of situations that you have to, where you have to do something out, you know, on the railroad somewhere and uh, far away from a facility, far away from where you can call. One of the things that I should tell you that is, you know, is like what a lot of the railroads want is they want to do things like send a train out with one person and then have somebody else that they theoretically could call up on the radio and that person would drive there with a truck. Well, you know, it's not the same for a variety of reasons, but maybe that wouldn't be as bad as having nobody. But the, uh, the I mean, the real thing is that when stuff happens, it happens quickly. It happens right away. You've got you've to gotta be able to have, you know, a, a response capability. And one of the things about the Megantic wreck was is that Tom, Tom Harding, that was his day off when he took that train that day. He wasn't supposed to work, but they, because they had switched over this system of running it with one person, they didn't have, they not only didn't have enough people, but they didn't even have anybody to call. And this is the important part I'm trying to make to you. It was like, it's one thing to say, okay, we're, we're gonna do this risky thing, but at least if there's somebody you can call, maybe they can make it less bad. But they had created a situation where they didn't even have a backup. They didn't have a, you know, they didn't have enough people and they didn't have any backup people. And so um, that's what, and, and, you know, Ed Burkhardt, the, the chief executive of, of Rail World that owned the MMA had been on the cover of Rail World magazine, you know, twice as the railroader of the year for all the wonderful, lean and mean and, and smart. He was also always known as being smart. Uh, you know, he'd done all these smart things. And, you know, um, that's when you get into trouble on the railroad. But. The word did not define the essence. <laughs> Well, I've generally learned, and a lot of you may have some related experiences, that the more people you involve, the less you can rely on everything having to be smart. You know, in other words, it has to be real simple. Everybody needs to understand it if you involve more and more people. And when you're on the railroad, you've got tens of thousands of people, and they all need to be on the same program. And so you can't do smart stuff i mean even if it works five days a week when when somebody's off on their day off and then they bring in the guy from somewhere else who hasn't had the memo that's when the bad stuff happens so you know all right we definitely need to let poor fritz go we've uh, you know i never thought i never thought this would go this long but the quality of your information um yeah. uh, you know speaks volumes here um the fact that we still have people online listening well that, i'm impressed myself because usually most people have zoom fatigue but um yeah. <laughs> well, well, we, we, we do, we do but... have zoom fatigue let me, let me <laughs> not because of you but because we're on zoom three nights a week <laughs> uh, that's right that's right but no. outstanding information and this will make a huge difference in in how we're going to be yeah. moving forward so thank well, you thank again, you Fritz. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll pass on Excellent information stuff. when I get it. And uh, right. hopefully we'll all have a chance to meet again in a better and safer place. Thank you. And if our yeah. core team could just stay on a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, okay. But thank you, Fritz. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> we'll.